Okay, so let's start. Uh, the next talk is about open source hardware by great Mitch Altman, and please give him a nice warm welcome. <laughs> So let's see what he has to, to talk about. <laughs> Curious myself. So uh, I'm going to uh, probably rant about a few things here. So um, yeah, well, my name is Mitch Altman, and I'm known for maybe a few things, but probably best known for inventing TV Be Gone, a keychain that turns TVs off in public places. and. Um, I um, uh, love going around the world also promoting hackerspaces. I co-founded NoiseBridge, a hackerspace in San Francisco, one of the earlier ones in the United States. And uh, I go around the world teaching people how to solder and how to make cool things with electronics. Uh, I love promoting open source hardware wherever I go. Um, and all, my, all the teaching I do is with open source hardware. So um, yeah, I'm a hacker. I consider myself a hacker. Uh, in particular, I'm a hardware hacker, uh, but mostly I'm a hacker. I hack. Uh, to me, that means taking anything that is, you know, and doing what I love with it. Uh, just taking anything. It's a resource. I can do what I want with it. We can all do what we want with any resources in the world, even if they're not as intended by the original makers of that resource. Um, but you take that, you improve your projects with it, and you share it. That's what hacking is all about, as I see it. Uh, and this talk is about hacking not just hardware, but in particular, I want to talk more about hacking ourselves and hacking society. Uh, the free open source community uh, that we are a part of is poised to change the world. And the world can use some improvement. And uh, that's what hacking is all about, taking things, improving it, and sharing it. So we can improve ourselves. We can improve our society. We can improve, improve the world with what we do. Um, yeah. So it's really great to be invited to Balkan. Um, I really wanted to go last year, but I was too busy to go. Um, and this is a place that my tax dollars paid to bomb the shit out of a while ago. So it's really great to be here to do something a bit more positive. Uh, rather than that. And I like promoting things that are a bit more positive than that, and as positive as possible. So, um, but you know, as a hardware hacker, I totally love that the logo for Balkan is a stylized integrated circuit. Uh, even though it was started, uh, or mainly organized by a mostly software group, which I think is great, a Linux group of uh, Novi Sad, and Vau Holland, which is about promoting open source culture everywhere. Um, but I take it as, um, being invited here as a, a sign that open source free culture is really getting more diverse and more opening and really taking off. And this is happening not just here but everywhere and it's just totally cool. Free software um, has been around much longer than uh, free open hardware, but free software is also really brand new on our planet. Um, computers aren't, haven't really been around that long. Uh, so, um, the community of open source software has been accepting and open for all who want to join it, which is one of the reasons why it's grown so large in its short existence and so wonderful. Uh, open source hardware, on the other hand, is very new. It's only been uh, four years since we invented the term, even. Uh, and it's only because people have gotten together in community that we have very recently have the Open Hardware Summit in 2010 where we defined what open hardware is. And basically it means that you can only have two restrictions. You can, uh, if anyone wants to use your idea, they have to share it with the same license, open source, and they have to give you credit. Other than that, there's no restrictions. You can't even restrict people making money with it if you want to call it free and open. Um, but all this free hardware, free software, all of it comes under the rubric of free culture, including hardware, software, and hackerspaces. And we're all part of this community here. Uh, and it's really part of a growing movement that's growing very quickly. You know, we're growing out of 
what I'll call the old paradigm, um, which is rather than benefit anyone, any community, we create uh, a piece of music, a quilt, a book, an idea for an invention, uh, a process for making a high-tech device, uh, a piece of software, whatever. We create these things and then we protect it. We protect our creation from a world of others out there who want to take it from us. And we tell people, you can't have this, it is mine. Stay away or I will sue your ass. That's the old paradigm. This method has been successful for some definition of success for some amount of time now. But what we're, what we're seeing emerge now, um, and what probably most, if not all of us here are into supporting, is much more open. We create whatever we create, and then we tell the world about it. We love sharing it, and then helping anyone who's interested learn as much as they can about it. Uh, this is actually not new. It's the way things have been in human existence for almost our entire human history. You know, like imagine a long time ago, way back when a bunch of us are sitting around the campfire with our clan or tribe or whatever, and uh, one person just gets, today, you know, I was daydreaming while I was collecting nuts and berries, and I thought of this great idea of how to make food better in the winter. And then everyone's like, tell us more. What's the, they're all excited about it. And they go, hell no, I'm not going to tell you. That idea is mine. I'm not going to share it with you. You're going to steal it from me. That would be kind of absurd. The only reason why we survived as a species on the planet is because we shared our ideas. We taught our ideas. We helped each other. We supported each other to survive in a sometimes hostile environment. So it's only been in recent times we have this notion that our ideas are our own and not to be shared. Um, you know, that's unlike most of us here. Um, and uh, in our movement, in our open source movement, we freely give our creations away. But this doesn't mean that we can't make a living from our ideas. Many of us do. Um, nope, not ready for that yet. Uh, I do make a living from selling TV Be Gone Universal Remote Controls. It is open source, and I make a living from it, from giving my ideas away. The detailed plans, all the aspects about it, everything anyone needs to know are available online. Anyone can download those plans and make their own, and I'm glad when they do. After they make their own, they usually are very excited about it. They turn off lots of TVs and they tell all their friends, many of whom might actually make their own TV be gone, but many of whom will probably buy my kit or buy my ready-made keychain. And they're excited about it. And they tell their friends, you can't buy PR like this. It's like the best PR possible. Um, but not only that, they turn off lots of TVs, <laughs> making the world a better place for everybody. <laughs> this is a win-win-win situation, which is the way things should be. Everybody benefits. Um, let's see. Yeah, so, you know, I'm not the only one making, I know, that makes a living from open source projects uh, that, that we love doing. My friend Nina Paley, for instance, is a filmmaker. She took five years off of her life and created a feature-length animated film called Sita Sings the Blues. Can you see it? It's really beautiful. Um, it's free. It's open source. You can download the full-res version or stream it for free. And yet she sells DVDs and other merch and enough people give her uh, money enough buying these things so that she can buy food and pay her rent and enough money to work on all of her current projects just from free open source project and my friend Lamar Freed who was on the cover of Wired magazine in 2011 makes a living creating and selling open source hardware kits all the documentation everything about it is online just like my TV Be Gone and she makes my TV Be Gone kits uh, her business last year uh, made over $13 million. 
This can grow rather big. Uh, many of my friends make a living creating and selling open source kits, just traveling around doing workshops in the world, teaching people how to make cool things with electronics. Many people around the world are making a living making and selling their own open source 3D printers, such as MakerBot used to do um, until they got military and VC funding and went closed source. Um, they had, had an incredibly cool open source company uh, that employed 200 people making a living doing what they loved. They all loved their jobs. Of course, all that changed when they went closed source, and now I don't know a single person that works there because life is too short to spend at a job day and night that you don't like, which is kind of sad. But um, there are other people who do make a living uh, making and selling open source 3D printers now. Um, so there are lots of us who are successful at making a living doing the open source projects we love. And I would love to see a lot more of us be doing this. Communities at hackerspaces, at hacker conferences, maker fairs, online, all over, we can support each other uh, to free ourselves from the wage slavery too, mon too many of us feel trapped in. We need more people exploring and doing what we love. And more people on our planet loving what they do. Now we're ready for this one. According to the internet, where all truth resides, 80% of the people in my country, the United States, are unhappy with their jobs. 80%. I think it's actually higher than that, but whatever the number is, it's really sad. Because we spend a third of our lives at work. Eight hours a day, probably more. A third of our lives, that's a eight hours of a day lost. And then we sleep eight hours a day. And we dream about what we went through during the day, which is the job we don't like. So that's 16 hours spent absorbed in what we don't like. And if you're like the average American who watches six and a half hours in front of a fucking TV, when have you had a chance to explore anything in your life that you might like? Let alone do what you like, let alone do what you love, let alone make a living doing what you love. But for the record, my name is Mitch Altman. I turn TVs off for a living, and I love my job. <laughs> <laughs> and I am here to say that you can too. If I could go from a total to depressed blob of a kid, which I was, to a jet-setting, crazy-haired inventor, a public-speaking inventor who loves my life. If I can do that, anybody can. Seriously. I really was a depressed blob of a kid. Growing up in my own little world, brutally bullied for being an introverted geek, fat, gay, bad at sports, with clueless parents and teachers who stood around and watched as I was beaten daily by bullies. Not a happy childhood. Um, you, you know, a yearning to be a part of other groups of kids, but not having a clue on how, I retreated into television, which became my first of many addictions. All of this totally sucked as a little kid, but as it turns out, it serves me well in later life, especially since I was a curious kid and I learned all I could about how the world around me worked. And while on my own, I had plenty of time to learn. And being not so influenced by my other peers, the horrible kids who beat me up as bullies, uh, I put the world together in my own unique, geeky way, which is a great thing for becoming an inventor. You know, we all have ideas. Some of them just come and go, but some of them gnaw at us in the back of our brain, demanding expression. We all have these ideas. And when we do, we have, as I see it, two choices. We can fight them, or we can go with them. If we fight them, we're really fighting ourselves. 
And if you fight yourself, you know who loses. So I'm here to encourage you all to go with it. When you have one of those ideas, go with it. You owe it to yourself. You owe it to the world. But to do this, we have to make time. We need to make time to explore what we love. This does take lots of time. First, many of us need to explore what we don't hate. It's kind of sad, but many of us don't know what we want to do that we don't even hate. I had to start that way as a depressed blob of a kid. Um, but you know, it takes time to explore what we like. And in order to do that, we have to stop doing what we know we hate. And once we start doing more of what we like, then maybe we can create time to explore what we may possibly love. We only have so much time, though. We're born at some point, but at some point, each of us, each one of you, is going to die. It's true. And in between, with what little time you have, what you do with that time is totally up to you and you alone. Each of you, what you do with your time, what are you going to do with that little bit of time? What you, will you choose to do with the time of your life? Choice is a really powerful thing. We have very little control over our lives. We can't control what we feel. We have very little control over even what we think. But we have a lot of control over what we choose to do. And as a consequence of what we choose to do, we will think and we will feel. But we have no control over those consequences, or what we think, or what we feel. But we can, if we choose to, then use what we think and what we feel and the other consequences as very useful information to make new conscious choices, from which we will then think and we will then feel, etc. Why not make those choices based on what we believe to the best of our ability will make our lives just a little bit cooler. Just a little bit. And maybe even take into account the lives of those around us and make choices based on what we think will make the people around us just a little bit cooler. We can make these choices if we want to. This, I think, is very obvious. It's easy to state. But it's not always easy to do. There are social pressures. It takes a lot of time and lots and lots and lots of trials and errors. And no matter what, life will continue to have its ups and its downs. But the process is way rewarding, way fulfilling. In fact, it's this process in itself that can give life meaning. Like, I don't want to tell any of you what to do and what not to do. Um, but this is the first choice I made for myself. Up until I made this choice, I was so full of self-loathing as a kid that I made all of my choices based on what I thought others wanted of me. I thought that if I did what others wanted, it would make others like me and stop bullying me. Of course, it didn't work. So I retreated more into television where I got more depressed, less in practice with dealing with other people, and less healthy and more fat. Yes, I was fat as a kid. And at some point, I was yet again watching yet another daily rerun of an awful United States sitcom on television that I watched every day and disliked every day. And it just struck me. I hate this. Why do I do this? I didn't know the answer to that, but I didn't know that I didn't have to do it anymore. So I unplugged the TV, I set it out on the curb, and ever since then, I've had way more time and energy. Most of my adult life, I worked as a consultant for small companies, taking my time and energy to do projects for little companies that were only doing those projects for making a profit for some other people. Nothing wrong with that, but it just wasn't what I wanted to do. 
Um, but, you know, it was okay enough. Uh, none of the projects were awful. I never did anything for the military. I always worked with people I liked, and, uh, you know, they were all kind of cool projects. For instance, doing uh, virtual reality in the mid-80s, and then in uh, the late 90s, starting a company called Threeware, where, uh, as far as I know, it's the first time that a company made open source drivers for Linux for their hardware. Uh, we made RAID controllers, if that means something to some of you. Um, and, um, you know, but, and by doing what I was doing, I made enough money in like several weeks to make enough money to live on for the rest of the year, which I thought was, you know, pretty cool. Um, but um, after a decade of this, I wanted more than just a pretty cool life. So, in 2003, I wanted to try an experiment on myself. I saved up enough money to live a year of expenses. I was lucky enough to be able to do that. And I told myself that in this year, I would only do what I love, plus laundry. Um, and uh, what would life be like if I only did what I loved? What would life be like for you if for a whole year you only did what you loved? I had no idea what that would be like. I had some fantasies, but I had no idea how I'd make money. But I thought that somehow there must be a way, doing what I love, to get enough of what I need to keep doing what I love. I started by doing a bunch of volunteer work that I knew I loved. And I started working on electronics projects that I'd only been, uh, you know, gnawing at the back of my head, those ideas I was talking about, ones that had been doing that for years, but somehow I never had the time and energy to play with these ideas after coming home working on electronics all day. TV Be Gone was one of these projects, and it really got on a roll for me. Um, it took over my life. I became driven by it, obsessed by it. I loved this project. Uh, I finally got one going and I went around San Francisco where I live, turning TVs off in public places and enjoying the hell out of it. And all of my friends wanted one. Go figure. It makes sense though, because they're my friends. And I figured I'd make one for everybody. But of course they told their friends. And most of their friends all wanted one. I, didn't, I couldn't make one for everyone. And I'm like, what am I going to do? It'd be fun to make one for everyone, but it would take too much energy. But they told their friends, and then it turns out that my friends, friends, friends mostly all wanted one, and then it struck me that this is an opportunity. So I took a gamble and I made as many as I could afford, which was 20,000 of them. And uh, I didn't know how long it would make, uh, take to at least break even with that. I figured, well, if it took five years or whatever, or whatever, then there'd be a lot of people turning TVs off all over the world. But as it turned out, I sold all 20,000 in three weeks. <laughs> and it's the only way I've made money since 2004. I don't make a lot of money with TV Be Gone, even though I sold a half a million of these things. Um, but I make enough money doing what I love to keep doing what I love. That's my definition of success. We need more success like this. The world needs more success like this. Each of us needs more success like this, and it's possible. I think the only way our world is going to get better is if more people actually do make a living doing what we each love. And certainly, each of your lives is going to be much better if you are making a living doing what you love. And certainly, even if you're not making a living doing what you love, if you're doing what you love, then you're doing what you love in your life. How is that a bad thing? It's a great thing. I encourage all of you to ex make time and explore and do more of this. Uh, and if you do what you love, then it's possible, not guaranteed, but possible that you can make a living doing what you love. The thing is, if you love what you do, chances are really good that others will love what you do too. You are not the only unique weirdo in the world. Other people will love what you do too. And in a capitalist society, as we find ourselves quite often in, when people love what you do, they will pay you to do it. It's true. And everybody wins, which is the way it should be. And if your projects are as free and open as possible, then so many people can benefit. 
So, a um, bit about open hardware. You know, when I invented TV Be Gone in 2003, no one really thought about open hardware. There was open software, free and open software, but not open hardware. As an inventor, with a brother who's a patent attorney, I did the normal thing, which was to patent my invention, TV Be Gone, so I did. But then in 2006, I went to my first hacker conference, and then to 23C3, the 23rd Chaos Communications Congress put on by, in Germany, put on by the Chaos Computer Club, an awesome conference. I've been to a few of them since then. Um, <laughs> the talk was about TV Be Gone, uh, and people there loved the project, but I got a lot of pushback by people questioning why I patented it. And I was like, of course I patented it. That's what inventors do. I gave the usual answer. It's like, I put a year and a half of my life into this thing, creating this project, TV Be Gone, and if I just give it away, then some company who doesn't give a shit about anything but profit is gonna take it, do a bad job in it, make a cheap one, and sell it and put me out of business. That was just the normal answer without even thinking about it. But I started thinking about it. And by the time I got home, I made TV Be Gone open source. The thing is, TV Be Gone was almost an open source project already. Lots and lots of talented engineers from around the world shared their ideas with me about how to make my project, my product, better. And then I went from there to share it with my customers. Um, and that's like an open source project. I'd already shared all of the TV off codes that took me a year and a half to collect with a lot of people because they were excited about turning TVs off. Um, and um, I'd already shared all the plans with people so they could make their own TV Be Gone remote controls. And as I said before, this has all been fantastic PR for selling more TV Be Gones as well as more and more people turning TVs off around the world. Again, win, win, win for everybody, and this is how things should be. Open source really is awesome. And I just took the extra step and just made it open source, even before we had the logo and the definition for it. Uh, and ever since then, all the plans have been online and anyone can make them. I don't know why more people don't do open hardware. It just works. But I think more and more people will, because it works. You know, it is an option to make a living doing what you love. There are, of course, other options. You can, if you like, make a living doing what you hate, or even what you don't like. That's an option. Most people seem to choose that option. I'm not sure why. If you explore and do what you love, you may find projects you love, and you may be able to make a living from them. No guarantee. But what is guaranteed that is if you don't explore and do what you love, you will not live a life you love. And you won't be making a living doing what you love. And we need to make a living doing what we love. If we don't, then we are essentially out of commission. We are too exhausted to, uh, from the work we do to come home and play with the free open projects that we need and that the world needs. And our lives will not get better. And the world will not get better. Now that so much of the world's economy has been on the skids for so long and so many people are finding themselves unemployed and underemployed, this is the perfect opportunity to explore creative ways to make a living. And with the communities available to all of us, we all have a lot of opportunities for exploring what we love and much better chances of exceeding each in our own way. So I'll just take a break here to offer some free services. Um, as part of this community, I hereby offer my services. First of all, if you ever find yourself in a position where you do not like your job and want to be talked into quitting, this is my contact <laughs> info. I am really good into talking people into quitting jobs they don't like. Take me up on it. Also, I'm totally happy to help anyone any way I can. Uh, please contact me if you have any questions you think I can help you with, uh, like with your projects, with manufacturing, running a small business, um, whatever. 
any way I can help, I, I, I love helping any way I can. And please contact me if you're depressed and you think I can help. Uh, I lived the first half of my life, like I said, in total depression, and I know what it's like, and we've lost too many awesome people to depression and suicide lately, and I would love it if all of us live it another day. So if I can help, please ask. Um, I also am happy to help uh, people start hackerspaces or keep hackerspaces going. And that's another thing I do. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a hackerspace is, imagine a place you can go to, very much like BalkCon here, except open every day, all day, all night, all year round. This is very much what a hackerspace is. Anyone here never been to a hackerspace? A few people. Wow. So there's 1,600 of these things in the world, and they're all awesome places with supportive community for people to explore and do what they love through hacking. It's really magical and amazing. Um, and I couldn't help but notice that there is not a hacker space in Novi Sad. Yes. This needs to change, and I'm here to help. So uh, let's talk about this throughout the conference. Um, but. Um, People work on projects alone, collaboratively, whatever works. They're physical spaces where people explore and do what they love through hacking, hardware, software, art, craft, food, science, music, anything and everything that people do in the hacker space that they're into and sharing with others so that they can explore and do what they love. It's really wonderful. People enthusiastically teach and learn and share. It's everyone of all skill levels is welcome. So um, they really are awesome. Uh, we all need community. We all need to create, and hackerspaces provide us with these two very deep human needs. Um, they're full of friendly, creative, introverted geeks like all of us. And um, yeah, wherever you live, wherever you travel, you can look up online the local hackerspace, and you're always welcome. You're definitely always welcome at uh, Noisebridge, where I live and the one I co-founded in San Francisco. Um, if uh, you think you're gonna visit San Francisco, come and see me, I have a few keys. You're welcome to a key. Everyone's welcome at Noisebridge. Um, if there isn't a hackerspace where you live, like here, start one. This is the way hackerspaces start. It's people like you start one. You know, it was just me and a friend started Noise Bridge, and then suddenly we had lots of people helping. This is the way it works everywhere. Um, every Monday, when I'm home in San Francisco, I teach Circuit Hacking Monday, which is teaching people who don't know how, how to solder and how to make cool things with electronics. When I'm not home, other people do it. And um, uh, when I'm on the road, I'm teaching it on the road all the time, like I'll be doing here on Sunday. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I've taught tens of thousands of people how to solder, and I only do it because I love it. It's fun. You get a bunch of people together and s have them all do something enjoyable like soldering, and they look like this. <laughs> it's really fun. So you're invited Sunday to the workshop I'll give, which is about Arduino for total newbies. Uh, and Arduino, if you don't know, is a little microcontroller, a computer board that allows anyone, even people who've never made anything in their life, be able to learn how to make cool things with electronics very quickly. And uh, going through this workshop, you can do it on your own. I just make it uh, maybe a little more fun and easy. Uh, so uh, yeah, you're all welcome to try that out on Sunday. Let's see. Next page. Yeah, let's see. I said all that. So let's get back to this. So back to our future. Um, you know, I think open source has uh, a great potential for changing not only all of our lives, but really improving the world. But there are a bunch of um, challenges that we all face uh, and that might get in the way of each of us along the way. It is fascinating, I think, and important to explore these challenges. Let me just go over a few of these. First of all, co-option 
is a very poor, powerful force to contend with in our lives. You, if you uh, explore and then do what you love, maybe you find a project, maybe you're even making a living from it, but you may be offered a job for money for your project. This can be a really good thing. It can also be something else. Who's offering the money? Are they people you like? Do you want to help those people? What if it were the military? What if it were a political party you disagree with? What if they wanted to use your project in ways that you thought might make the world a worse place? It's up to you. You may be offered a high-paying job. You may be offered a job with state-of-the-art shiny things. If the job is what you believe you really love, then this is totally awesome. If the job is just an offer for more money or more shiny things to play with, then is this the job really what you want to do with your time, your energy, and your life? Answering questions like these is not necessarily easy. It's not obvious. And there are no right or wrong answers. But what is clear, though, is that money and shiny things are not fulfilling in and of themselves. And if we make choices based on getting more and more of those things, money, shiny things, etc., then we may be taking away time and energy from doing things that we truly love, things that make our lives better and the lives of those around us better. In the United States, my country, the research arm of the United States military, DARPA, was recently involved in throwing money at hackers and hackerspaces all over the country. The explicit intent of these grants was to ensure the future of superior technology for the US military. That's from their website. It seems to me that individuals in this bureaucracy saw so many of the amazingly cool projects done by hackers and happening at hackerspaces with very little resources and in very short amounts of time. They saw magic happening. It really is magic. And they wanted to buy that magic. They attempted to buy that magic. But you really can't buy that magic. You have to create it. Maker fairs are incredibly wonderful gatherings of tens of thousands of, of geeks enthusiastically sharing their projects. I love Maker Faire. I used to help them a lot. I put a lot of years of my life into Maker Faire until they got a $10 million grant from the research arm of the US military, DARPA. It was a very difficult decision for me to quit helping Maker Fairs. Both DARPA and Maker Fair continually said that there were no strings attached to the money and that it was unimportant that the money came from the US military. This seemed unlikely to me. <laughs> DARPA now recruits at Maker Fairs. No strings attached, my fucking ass. Um, <laughs> MakerBot used to be an awesomely cool, totally open source 3D, company, 3D printer company. They got VC and military research money. They are no longer open source. They are no longer a place where anyone I know wants to work. OWN 2013 was a huge outdoor hacker camp in the Netherlands last year. It was way awesome. However, their main sponsor was Fox IT, a company that sold surveillance tools to Mubarak. Remember him? Yes. He used to rule Egypt. He killed lots of people. I didn't think it was a good idea to help this guy um, or a company who helps him. So I stopped being one of the main organizers for OM as a result of that. After uh, the main organizers uh, refused to give that money back. And of course, Fox IT recruited at home. Maui Makers, a hackerspace in the US, in Hawaii, got a half million dollars for education for space exploration from DARPA, the research arm of the US military. 
Rather than jeopardize this military funding, they stopped working with members of their own team who lived in places that the military didn't like, like China or the evil, evil enemy, the United Kingdom. One team member who lived in China for quite a while uh, with a Chinese wife chose to move away from China to keep receiving DARPA money. No strings attached? Funding sources do matter. If you take money from anyone whose values do not align with yours, then you are helping the people whose values do not align with yours. Is this what you want to do? Is it worth it? Again, there's no easy answers, and there's no right and wrong. It's your choice. But these are important choices. It's important to explore since your future depends on how the answers play out. The biggest challenge to our future is ourselves. Freedom is frightening. It's scary to make choices different from those around you. It's, uh, it's scary to make choices differently from your friends, your family, your peers. We live in a world where it is encouraged to make choices out of fear of not having enough. So we tend to grope for more, more money, more security, more stuff. We're encouraged through TV, magazines, movies, newspapers to distract ourselves rather than to do what we truly want. There is nothing wrong with doing what you don't want to do. But is this really what you want to do? The choice is yours. We all want to live loves we love. We as geeks have found ways of creating community, community that supports us to explore and do what we love in the form of hacker conferences, hacker uh, spaces, and other communities. We have created this. The world is looking to us. In community, at hacker conferences like this one and other conferences around the world at hacker spaces, we are creating and sharing awesome free open projects. As a result, our lives become better. By sharing our projects with others, the lives of others around us get better. If enough of us do this, the world gets better. Please choose well what you do with the time of your life. And thank you for your time. So I think we have a little time for questions and answers if anyone wants to ask or comment or rant. I don't know. <laughs> Anybody? I'm sorry, I'm going to sleep. Well, you know, uh, you, you insert so much uh, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, you inserted a lot of uh, positive feedback in, into your uh, life, into your presentation, into your emotions, and you're sort of uh, attached to the attraction of love and uh, generosity and positive feedback. But there's uh, human beings that are capable of thinking and, and feeling different kinds of dynamics. This is one kind of dynamic. It's ideal, it's like a Hindu religion, maybe, maybe Buddhism. It's constancy that, that, that uh, this defines this satisfaction of pleasing life, pleasing work, and all that. But I have a feeling that uh, uh, there are many different uh, types of uh, thought uh, that can present to us if we realize that there are perhaps opposing forces that define our existence. Even though they're opposing, you know, they're just a just natural way in which uh, uh, nature is programming us or 
are enticing us to do our, our more in life or something like that. It can be the desire to escape or the love to get something or, or something conflicting or paradoxical. Uh, all, all those sorts of uh, uh, dy dynamical models of thought and behavior uh, are, are, are possible and we only need to engage them. But the, the problem is that the, the economy, um, economy um, our resources are running away. They're escaping. You can view a few people that are sitting in front of you and say, you're my resource, you will work for me. And this is positive feedback. But since they are escaping, evading everything, they're constantly changing. Uh, and uh, we don't really have the world to exploit. For the most, for the majority of people, it's sort of a, a you know, it's a, it's a poor world that where they don't have really any uh, anything to uh, any resource to exploit. They don't have uh, the planetary resource to exploit in a cyber technological manner because. If, uh, in the end, even small circuit boards tend to be expensive in Serbia, and uh, all our circuit boards uh, tend to go to the Africa, where they're burned in fires for for the extraction of uh, metals. Uh, I only wish to quote uh, the last year's conference speaker, Dušan uh, Nikolić, uh, who came from to Delft University in uh, Poland. And uh, he mentioned this, uh, this because he was studying complex systems in society. So um, I, I just uh, um, have a feeling that this that you have really created a bright point, a bright light uh, uh, in our human experience. But I think that we 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 have many more domains of experience. Uh, uh, perhaps less, there's uh, so many, uh, there's an infinite number of possibilities on our planet and the universe. What are you going to focus on? What do you want to do with your life? I can't change the fact that piles of shit are burned in Africa. I can choose not to add to it, and I do choose not to add to it. But what do you want to do in your life? Are you going to base your decisions based on all the terrible things happening in the world? Are you going to focus on all the terrible things happening in the world and then say, oh, the world's a terrible place, so I'm not even going to bother to explore things that might be fulfilling in my own life? That's an option. There might be other options, though. We don't have control over our own life, let alone the lives of others, but we do have a lot of control, like I said, over what we choose to do. There's no guarantee what the consequences of those choices will be, but we'll learn from those choices, and we can make new choices based on what we learn. You can, if you want to, make those new choices based on what you think will make your life worse. You can, if you want to. Do you want to? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can make choices based uh, on whatever input you have available. This is what hacking is all about. You know, all the choices, um, the consequences of our previous choices are resources to draw from so we can improve upon to make our projects better. And the project might be your life. It might be the lives of those around you. Um, why not make those choices uh, based on what you think might make things a little bit cooler? You can if you want to. You can do other things too. I mean, I'm not telling you what to do and what not to do. You can do whatever you want, and I hope you do. And I hope you make those choices consciously and learn from them to make better choices as you see them, as you define better. You know, life has ups and downs no matter what. We don't have to go out of our way to find the downs. They'll find us, and we'll learn from them if we want to. But we might as well try to the best of our abilities to do something that we believe is positive. Why not? See what happens. I'll quit my job. <laughs> <laughs> I'll support you in that. <laughs> Beginning Monday. <laughs> sure, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how do you take care of the running costs of Noise Bridge? Noise Bridge, uh, you know, every hackerspace has different uh, a model for how it's funded. Noise Bridge, um, 
you know, and all hyperspaces are unique. There's a lot of similarities. Noisebridge is probably uh, unique in that all of our money comes from membership dues and donations. Uh, two thirds, I was the first treasurer of Noisebridge, so I know at the beginning two thirds of our income came from membership dues and a third from individual donations, with just a little bit from donations for t-shirts. And um, that's it. So there are other hacker spaces that make money by charging for classes. They actually pay teachers. At Noisebridge, we don't have a rule about it, we only have one rule, which is be excellent to each other. All else follows from there. Um, but uh, as it turns out, all of our classes and workshops and events are free, and people are free to give donations if they want to. Um, but other hacker spaces, they charge for workshops and classes, for events, sometimes a lot, and then they pay the presenters. Um, and that works well for those hacker spaces. Uh, there's ones that also have part co-working space. Um, and they'd be sure to keep the co-working part very separate from the hacker space part because if there's a conflict, the people who are paying money tend to feel like they have more right to the shared resources than the people who are just there doing merely what they love rather than doing something for money. Um, so uh, that's one of the hackerspace design patterns, actually. Uh, and if you're interested in how any community, or in particular a hackerspace community, can be improved, look up hackerspace design patterns. It's really quite enlightening. But yeah, so keeping the for-profit and um, uh, non-profit separate is important for hackerspaces that make money from things like co-working space. Um, but yeah, these are just some of the ways that hackerspaces um, fund themselves. Uh, oh, and Noisebridge also, we just had a very successful Indiegogo crowdsource campaign. We were getting, looking for 25,000, we ended up getting 27,277. So uh, that was just last week. And uh, we have about once a year a fundraising party, which is really fun and raises us about $5,000. Any other questions? Cool, well, feel free to find me. I'm not going anywhere until uh, Wednesday, so uh, <laughs> grab me and uh, I'm happy to talk about whatever you like. So thanks, everyone. <laughs>